I recently did a video about all of the woven canalers and it was this photo that inspired that video. This is the woven canaler Albert M. Marshall downbound at Sault Ste. Marie, likely near Mission Point. The photo was found in the Library of Congress and it is fascinating not only because of its clarity but also because there are 11 of her 21 crew members seen in the photo. It's pretty rare to capture more than half of a lake freighter's crew out on deck while the boat is underway. So we're going to take the opportunity in this video to not only look closely at her, but also at them. First, however, we're going to examine the circumstances behind this photo and how the marshal got into it. Now, if you haven't seen my video, The Woven Canalers, I'd suggest that you either go do so right now and then come back here, or see that video after this video is finished. Although there is no reliable date attached to this photo, there are, however, some clues. The ice seen in the photo is spring breakup ice, which indicates that this shot was likely taken on the first downbound trip of the season. Additionally, the image is from the Detroit Photographic Company. Most of their images that reside in the Library of Congress were shot between 1904 and 1912. So taking that information, I dug into the spring breakout passages for those years. In most of the years that I looked at, the marshal didn't pass the Sioux until well after the ice was gone from the St. Mary's River. Yet one year, however, did stick out. It was the opening of the 1907 navigation season, and the insurance companies had not set an opening date. So vessel owners started dispatching their boats as soon as whatever harbor ice they had been laid up with was clear enough to make the passage. Many actually sailed in the first days of April, and their owners paid the price. A good example was the big ore boat William A. Rogers, which departed from Lorraine and the Charles A. Weston that departed from Toledo. Both headed out on April 1st, bound for Duluth, and both were owned by William M. Mills. He figured that bringing his boats out about two weeks early, he could get a head start profit on the season. The cost of running each vessel, he said, was about $100 per day in 1907. That would be $2,991 per day in 2022. Interestingly, most modern lake boats cost almost that much per hour to operate. Both of these vessels sailed up Lake Huron to detour and the mouth of the St. Mary's River. They ran head-on into one of the worst ice jams in Great Lakes history. Meanwhile, the marshal was taking on a load of coal at Buffalo. A part of the chess game that Wolven played with his fleet of canalers was to pre-position them at winter layup. In this case, the marshal was positioned in Buffalo to allow her to get an early start with a lucrative upbound load of coal for Duluth. She headed out on schedule on April 11th. Unfortunately, she was steaming across eastern Lake Erie when the Buffalo newspapers came out with this. Predictions were that the ice at the Sioux would be impassable for perhaps as long as another 10 days. In fact, as the marshal passed Detroit, the die was already cast. She would actually not be returning to the lower lakes for nearly a month. There is no record as to exactly when the marshal arrived at Detour. But as she sailed upbound, the crowd of lake boats stuck in the ice grew larger. In just a few days, 
there were nearly 60 Lakers stuck in the ice, with a steady stream of boats headed upbound from Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Finally, the call went out for a, quote, ice crusher to go up and break the way up to the Sioux. This was many years before government icebreakers were born. The only vessel that was developed for the task of breaking ice was the Algoma. Her normal turf was the Straits of Mackinac. At first, her owners wanted $150 from the owners of each lake boat that she broke free. The owners initially refused. But within 24 hours, a deal was made, and the Algoma went to work at a rate of $400 per day. Just 48 hours later, a path had been opened to the Sioux, and 65 lake boats headed upbound, including the Marshall, plus her sister ships, the H.G. Dalton and the Robert Wallace. Also in this parade were the two boats that had started upbound 24 days earlier, the Charles Weston and the William Rogers. Plus, there was another 40 boats right behind them. The Marshall locked upbound at 6.30 that morning, just in time to run into another blockade. This photo was taken of that blockade. The date is either April 26th or 27th, 1907. All of the boats seen here locked upbound between 8.30 Thursday evening and 11 o'clock Friday morning, April 26th. This ice jam was nothing like the one down in Detour. It pretty much just slowed the boats to a crawl and most of the fleet seen here were out by early on the 28th. On the way toward Duluth, the newspapers published another bit of bad news, especially for the Weston and the Rogers, who had already spent nearly a month steaming upbound with their coal cargoes. The impending crowd of inbound vessels caused the coal docks to start a waiting list for unloading. For the Rogers alone, she would be ninth on the list at her dock, and thus may not be unloaded until the middle of the next week. So much for Mr. Mills getting a jump on the season. The waiting vessel expenses alone would likely eat up the profits for cargoes all the way into June. And it was all because of the ice. The marshal, however, arrived in Duluth on April 29th, unloaded, and then went over and picked up a grain cargo for Buffalo. She departed on May 3rd. Captain Beale must have been tickled as they steamed past the crowd of big freighters who were rafted together and waiting to unload. The marshal was about halfway across Lake Superior when the winds came up out of the northwest. That took all of the broken ice in Whitefish Bay and the upper St. Mary's River and blew the chunks down into the locks and the rapids. As a result, locking down was now slowed. The marshal locked down at 4.30 on Saturday afternoon, May 4th. And waiting for her near Mission Point was a photographer from the Detroit Publishing Company. He gave us this amazing, detailed view of a woven canaler as she passed. Let's get a good close-up study of her. Here we see Captain Beale and the boat's wheelsman in the open-air bridge setting up to make the turn. Notice that the lower panels of the bridge can be removed to give the captain a better view below. Here we see her forward crew watching the ice go by. Do you think these guys have seen enough ice for a while? The big white drum seen here is for drinking water. Normally in this era, the boat took on drinking water right out of the lake, either in eastern Lake Superior or northern Lake Huron. The white buckets contained sand for fire suppression. 
Notice this wire. The woven canalers had electric lights, and this wire powered the starboard navigation light. This thick wooden hull strake runs almost the length of the boat and protects the steel hull plates from being dented by bumping against the stone walls of the locks along the Canadian Canal system. Looking aft, we can see some interesting features of a woven canaler. First note that there are no deck houses. This type of construction is known as submarine decking, where all crew accommodations are under the aft deck. Next, way up on her smokestack, we can see her triple chime whistle. All of the woven class canalers were equipped with these distinctive whistles. Here we see some of her crew on deck. Here, here, and here. But my favorite crewman is right here. One of the cooks is watching the ice go by. The aft quarters on a woven canaler had a hallway inside, and there was a hatch at each end of that hallway. This one was right where the galley is located. The marshal passed downbound at Detroit on May 6th at 3 o'clock in the morning. She arrived at Buffalo with her cargo of grain on May 7th, 1907. Her first round trip of the season was just four days short of being a full month long. All because of the ice.